on this Friday night. The Prime Minister's Chief of Staff in the hot seat. Madam Chair, the Prime Minister... Yes or no? Katie Telford grilled on who knew about the misconduct allegations against Canada's former top soldier and when. I'll remind you what my role was in this. Rising COVID cases and rising unemployment. New evidence the third wave is infecting Canada's job market. Locked up and languishing. I cry every day when I think about my husband. The Canadian man stuck in a Chinese prison for 15 excruciating years. And a deep dive for answers. The war mystery that took decades to solve. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening. Glad to be with you. The Prime Minister's top advisor was grilled today by opposition MPs about her knowledge of sexual misconduct allegations against Canada's former top soldier. Katie Telford told a Commons committee she did not know the content of a complaint against General Jonathan Vance until Global News broke the story. Her testimony follows days of demands by Conservatives to know what she knew and when. David Aiken has our top story tonight. And I was, of course, very concerned. Katie Telford spent the two hours Friday in front of the House of Commons National Defence Committee, pressed for details about what she knew in 2018 of a misconduct allegation against former Defence Chief General Jonathan Vance. She was asked repeatedly, for example, why she decided not to tell the Prime Minister about the matter. But she did not answer directly. At the time, what I was wanting to ensure was done to protect the complainant was that the proper next steps were taken. And that's what I did immediately, and that's what I took seriously, and then there was no more information to be had. Telford is Trudeau's longest serving and closest advisor, the PM's one and only chief of staff. There is no one in government with more influence or power than Telford, save for Trudeau himself. And that's what made her testimony central to the issue of accountability. And it's why opposition MPs found her non-answers difficult to accept. But not just a run-of-the-mill complaint about sexual misconduct. This is against the person who was in charge of rooting it out in the Canadian military, which is what makes this different from all the others. You, you guys dropped the ball is what's happened here. Now let's, you know, this personal misconduct issue that you didn't follow up on. Vance has denied all accusations of inappropriate behavior, and Telford said there was not enough information in 2018 for the government to act. My office and the minister were not given the substance or the details of the allegation. We did not know what the complaint was about. Telford testified that it was not until March this year, after Global News first reported the details of the allegations against Vance, that she and Trudeau learned of the true nature of those 2018 allegations. And those news reports this year have spurred them to action. Because you're right, more needed to be done and more needs to be done. The opposition today was focused on the past, who should be held accountable for decisions taken and not taken in the spring of 2018. And that's an important issue, but the more important issue may be the government's follow through on the implementation of reforms, reforms that cannot come quick enough for many women in the Canadian Armed Forces. Farah? And I'll be watching this closely. Thank you, David. And a long-awaited bill requiring new judges undergo further training for sexual assault cases has become law. Bill C-3 received royal assent last night in the Senate. The legislation requires federally appointed judges to commit to continued education on race, gender and other social factors that influence bias in decisions. This legislation will help restore trust in our criminal justice system for survivors of sexual assault and for all Canadians while making sure that everyone is treated with respect and dignity. The private member's bill was introduced in 2017 by former interim Conservative leader Rana Ambrose. To COVID-19 next and new restrictions coming to multiple provinces after days of surging infections. In Nova Scotia, a record-breaking 227 new cases were reported today. Officials say they have no choice but to impose tougher measures. They're pleading with people to comply. It feels out of control right now, and we will have a very tough May. That is the honest, plain truth. But what, what is also true is that if we stay committed, we will start to emerge in June and can look forward to a much brighter summer. 
Starting tomorrow and for the rest of May, Nova Scotia's border will be closed for all but essential reasons. Businesses are being told to sell only essential items and schools will stay closed until at least the end of May. Manitoba is bringing in new measures starting on Sunday to try to slow a surge in cases and ICU admissions. In a rare province-wide address held over the dinner hour, the province's top doctor announced several new measures, including the closure of gyms, casinos, museums and libraries, indoor religious services will be banned, restaurants and bars won't have in-person dining, but takeout will be allowed, malls will operate at 10% capacity. The restrictions are going to be in effect until May 30th. 502 new cases were reported today. That is the highest daily count since last November. The province says about 70% of new cases are people under 40. In Winnipeg, the test positivity rate, 11.3%. Alberta still remains the hardest hit province per capita. Restaurant patios will be shut down as of Monday, and the province is also working on getting more Albertans vaccinated, and that now includes a cross-border deal with Montana. Starting on Monday, Alberta truck drivers entering Montana will be offered a shot of the single-dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The vaccinations will take place at a rest stop. About 2,000 truckers will be eligible. The third wave of the pandemic has hit the Canadian economy hard. Statistics Canada says the country shed 207,000 jobs last month. The losses nearly wiped out the 303,000 jobs that were added in March. The bulk of the job losses were in hard-hit sectors that employ a lot of young people. And as Eric Sorensen explains, many of those workers have been on a constant seesaw trying to find work in a pandemic. When the biggest province shuts down, the national economy takes a big hit. A third COVID wave has turned Ontario into a roller coaster economy that keeps knocking the same people out of work. To like pay my bills, cover my debt. That's Dylan Mawson when he lost his job a year ago. He works at this Toronto restaurant. He got back to work last summer and fall when the distillery district reopened, but it all shut down again over the winter and he lost his job again. I've been out of rope for a long time, but I'm still hanging on and I think that's kind of what most of us are probably doing out there like no restaurant is flourishing right now so welcome to the zigzag economy with the labor market dancing to the tune of uh, the virus the national unemployment rate rose 0.6 to 8.1 percent last month not as high as a year ago when the rate topped 13 percent but still unrelenting well above the five to six percent range before the pandemic in the depths of a lockdown, Ontario lost 150,000 jobs last month, but COVID-19 doesn't hit provinces uniformly. Ontario's unemployment rate jumped 1.5% in April. In BC, which also imposed restrictions, the rate was also up slightly. Meantime, the jobless rate in Alberta and Nova Scotia actually fell. But those two provinces now face their own COVID-hit economies. Nova Scotia just imposed restrictions after its biggest spike in COVID cases so far. And the service sector can expect to take the brunt. When the virus is uh, peaking and we have a closure of the economy, you see those jobs in services, in food, uh, in, uh, in retail disappearing very, very quickly. Still, as the summer approaches, analysts predict the economy will rebound vigorously, in part because a lot of money has been saved and will be spent when places like restaurants reopen. I know that I'm going to be working again eventually. I hope it's in the summer. That is my hope. A hope shared among those hit by the zig that they'll benefit from the zag in this up and down economy. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. There are concerns about the supply of oil to much of Canada after Michigan's governor ordered the shutdown of a critical pipeline by next week. Enbridge Line 5 has been bringing crude oil from Alberta to central Canada since 1953, passing through Michigan and under the Straits of Mackinac, where two of the Great Lakes meet. Michigan believes the aging pipeline is an environmental disaster waiting to happen. As Jackson Prosco reports, a shutdown could spark an economic crisis. What a gorgeous day we have today. In the waters near her northern Michigan home, Patty Peak sees both beauty and concern. Beneath these beautiful waters is 23 million gallons of oil flowing every day. Peak chairs the Straits of Mackinac Alliance, an environmental group fighting to shut down what lies below Enbridge Line 5. Our Great Lakes are at great risk. 
it's very hard to put a price on what would happen if we have a, a, a significant spill. The pipeline from Alberta is fueling concern in Michigan because it's nearly two decades beyond its design lifespan. It sits exposed on the lake bed, at risk from boat anchors and cables. One day more is one day too long. Michigan's governor agrees. Protecting the Great Lakes. And has ordered Enbridge to stop using the pipeline by May 12th. The Calgary-based company plans to defy the order. So you're confident that even though it's beyond the design lifespan, it's, it's still safe? Yes, and in fact, it's not just me saying it, it's the federal government saying it. In fact, regulators in Washington have approved continued use of Line 5. Enbridge is now in mediation and is headed to court, arguing Michigan doesn't have authority to sever this critical link to Canada. What we do know is that there will be uh, a lot of political statements made, uh, but functionally, uh, there should be no disruption to that pipeline. Disruption would be major. Jet fuel for Canada's busiest airport, Toronto Pearson, comes from oil sent through Line 5. So does almost half of the gasoline, propane and diesel in Ontario and Quebec. The mayor of Sarnia, where the pipeline meets refineries, says thousands of jobs hang in the balance. This is not just about a pipeline to Sarnia. This is about the relationship between Michigan and Ontario, the relationship between the United States and Canada. With the deadline looming, the Trudeau government has pressed the Biden White House to intervene. If talks fail, Canada may invoke a little-known pipeline treaty from the 1970s. Long term, Enbridge has applied to move the pipeline to a half a billion dollar tunnel deep under the straits, a process that would leave Line 5 running as is for years. One more anchor strike can change all of this. Back on the water, Patty Peak worries the lakes can't wait. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Japan extends a state of emergency. Coming up, the race to keep the Tokyo Olympics on track as COVID-19 spreads. Plus, the latest province to prioritize vaccinating pregnant women. New COVID-19 measures are casting more doubt on the Tokyo Olympics. With just 11 weeks until the Games, the Japanese government extended its state of emergency for Tokyo and three other areas after recent restrictions failed to drive down cases. The government says it's hopeful it'll get the situation under control in time for the Games. A COVID-19 vaccine developed in China has been granted emergency approval by the World Health Organization. The Sinopharm vaccine is the first from China and the sixth in the world to get the green light from the WHO. It's promising news for the UN-backed COVAX initiative, which aims to get doses to countries in need. Sinopharm has reportedly offered substantial support to that program. The B.C. government has joined Ontario and Quebec in making pregnant women a priority in getting the COVID-19 vaccine. Doctors have been sounding the alarm about the growing number of expectant mothers in the ICUs with the virus. Research shows pregnant women are at a high risk of developing severe symptoms. Robin Gill reports. Danielle McManus is expecting her first child and her first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. The 35-year-old admits she had some trepidation and took the time to ask as many questions with as many doctors before making this decision. I feel strongly that it's the right choice for myself and my family. Is this your first COVID vaccination today? It is, yes. Health Canada has approved the vaccine for pregnant women and doctors are encouraging them to get the shot at any time during their pregnancies. There is a good safety data so far with the vaccines in pregnancy and no reason to believe that we will see concerns, particularly related to pregnancy. COVID-19 is now hitting people in their 30s and 40s hard. The demographic many pregnant women fall into and the virus is putting their lives and their babies at risk. When a person becomes pregnant, we know that they're at increased chance of being admitted to hospital, as well as at increased chance of being admitted to the ICU. And while they're pregnant, they're at increased chance of delivering early. That's what worried Megan Gilly. She wears two hats, emergency room physician and new mom. Gilly didn't hesitate, believing she's passing on a layer of protection to baby Henry. I was near tears um, that I w was able to get my vaccine. Um, and to be able to do that before Henry was born was just really exciting um, with the possibility of antibodies going from my body to his as well. There may be an added bonus of the antibodies in breast milk, but more research needs to be done. 
After getting the jab, Danielle McManus has a bounce in her step and a weight lifted off her shoulders. As far as receiving a second shot, no, I have no hesitancy at this time. One shot done, another to go, and there's still that baby coming in three months. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. Jailed in China. You've heard of the two Michaels. Ahead, we're going to introduce you to another Canadian prisoner. You're watching Global National. The arrests of Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor by China is largely seen as retaliation for the arrest of Chinese telecom executive Meng Wanzhou in British Columbia in 2018. The Prime Minister says it's obvious that the two Michaels were detained on trumped-up national security charges. Tonight, Jeff Semple looks at China's harsh tactics and another Canadian jailed there. Camilla Talindabaeva can barely look at old family photographs. It's so difficult. Memories of her four sons growing up west of Toronto. When I see them, I'm very proud, but something is missing, you know. Camilla's husband, Hussein Chalil, was an outspoken member of China's persecuted Uyghur minority. 20 years ago, the couple was granted refugee status and fled to Canada, becoming Canadian citizens. In 2006, they traveled on their Canadian passports to Uzbekistan to visit family. But without warning, Chalil was arrested and extradited to China, accused of being a separatist and a terrorist, and sentenced to life in prison. I cry every day when I think about this case, when I think about my husband. In 15 years, she's had no contact with Chalil. China hasn't even allowed Canadian officials to visit. I think Hussein Shalil's case is absolutely one of the most egregious, if not right now the most egregious uh, instance of, of long-term imprisonment of, of a Canadian citizen on completely unjust grounds. But he's not alone. More than 100 Canadians are currently detained in China, including the two Michaels. Their case has garnered international attention, while Shalil has scarcely received a mention. Could you share a little bit about your engagement on the Chalil case? On the what? Canada's ambassador to China seemed unaware last year that Chalil was even Canadian. Basically, because he's a he's not a Canadian citizenship, he, we are not allowed to provide, we aren't able to get access to him on a consular services side. Yeah, Mr. Chalil actually is a Canadian citizen. Chalil's Canadian citizenship is irrelevant to the Chinese government, which doesn't recognize dual nationality. Critics say Canada also treats dual nationals differently. And we just don't see their cases rise to the top of the list. And it's impossible to deny that to a certain degree there's an aspect of racism. All those in favour... The House of Commons recently concluded what Chalil had been saying for years. China's mistreatment of Uyghurs amounts to genocide. Camilla hopes those growing calls for accountability might help to finally bring her husband home. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. And tomorrow on The New Reality, Jeff speaks with an advocate who has spent the last 30 years fighting to free China's political prisoners, including Canadians. That's Saturday at 7, right here on Global. Mission for Answers, next, where two Canadian soldiers will finally be laid to rest. This is always an important week in the Netherlands. Wednesday was a national holiday in that country, the annual remembrance of their liberation in 1945. Of course, Canada played an important role in ending occupation by Nazi Germany. Mike Armstrong reports on the efforts to solve a mystery for the families of two Canadian airmen who fought to free the Netherlands. It's not something she ever thought she'd touch, but it's part of Fiona Williams' family history. It's a piece of an aircraft, bomber BK-716, lost for seven decades with seven airmen on board. That's William's uncle, third from the right. They were almost home, and they got shot down just before they hit England. The crew was part of a massive bombing operation in March of 1943. More than 300 bombers were sent out to hit Berlin, 33 were lost. BK-716 disappeared without a trace on its way back to base in England. 
Well, its whereabouts are a mystery no more. A Dutch documentary crew followed the recovery operation last fall, filming as a team carefully sifted through the wreckage, in fact, very carefully. In addition to parts of the aircraft and personal items, they did recover some human remains. They haven't been tested yet, but there were two Canadians on board. Flight Sergeant John McCaw of Belleville, Ontario, and William's uncle, Flying Officer Harry Farrington of Niagara Falls. We were very close. Farrington's sister, William's mother, still lives in Niagara Falls. He was wonderful. He was six foot two, probably. He worked in the bank, and the bank manager tried so hard to not get him to join up. The Netherlands sent the family that piece of the plane. They've been told all of the human remains will be buried in a proper ceremony together as a crew. That could happen depending on the pandemic as soon as this fall. Williams says she'll be taking her mother, that it is something they will absolutely not miss. Mike Armstrong, Global News. What a story. Sunday is Mother's Day, a day honoring the special women in our lives. The pandemic means celebrations, of course, are going to be different again this year. But there's an eatery in Oakville, Ontario, that's making sure tributes come in and the community benefits. This is the Nonna Wall at Ritorno Restaurant. Now, Nonna is the Italian word for grandmother. Guests can put a photo on the wall, and for every picture, the restaurant donates a meal to those hardest hit by the pandemic. That is Global National for this Friday. I'm Farah Nasser. I wish all you moms a very happy Mother's Day. I can't wait to hug mine, but soon. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other.